Welcome readers. Today on Book Chat, joining me is my Buddy Reads co-host, Classy Green. We'll be discussing the audiobook version of thriller title The Chain by Adrian McKinty, narrated by January Lavoie. Stay tuned. Today's episode is brought to you by the Shelf Addiction merch store. Check out all the bookish t-shirts, notebooks, mugs, and more. Don't miss out on these original designs, perfect for any book nerd. Support the podcast and visit shelfaddiction.com forward slash merch and pick up your next favorite bookish item. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Tamara Ford, and thank you for downloading this month's Buddy Read discussion featured here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. If you're new here and you're wondering, what is a Buddy Read? This feature is where Classy and I select a standalone title that we're both interested in, and we have a fun, candid conversation about the book or audiobook. We even discuss it in our Facebook group, Shelf Addiction Official, during a live chat. So grab your glass of wine, a cocktail, a cup of tea or coffee, grab your drink of choice, and settle in for this lively discussion. As always with book chats, there is a spoiler alert in effect. You've been warned. Don't miss our movie adaptation fantasy casting toward the end of this podcast episode. If you enjoyed today's show, please support this podcast by sharing it with one book nerd friend or on your favorite social media space. That will really help me out and I appreciate you. You can find both Classy and myself on Instagram and Twitter. If you read the book or listen to the audiobook and would like to contribute to this conversation, be sure to join the Shelf Addiction Official Facebook group. I hope to hear your thoughts on this discussion. The links for everything I've mentioned are below in the show notes. We've got a lot to cover today, so we're going to jump right on in. Joining me is the Buddy Read feature co-host, Classy Green. Welcome back, Classy. Hi, Tamara. Thanks for having me again. Of course. It's so good to talk to you. Yes, always the same for uh, to talk with you as well. Yes. Okay, so today we're discussing the audiobook version of The Chain by Adrian McKinty, and it was narrated by January Lavoy. It was published July 9th, 2019 by Mahalan Books and Hachette Audio, respectively. And it is 357 pages hardcover, and it comes in at 10 hours and 9 minutes on the unabridged audiobook. So before we jump in, Classy, go ahead and share the synopsis. Okay, the synopsis is being read from goodreads.com, The Chain by Adrian McKinty. You just dropped off your child at the bus stop. A panicked stranger calls your phone. Your child has been kidnapped and the stranger explains that their child has also been kidnapped by a completely different stranger. The only way to get your child back is to kidnap another child within 24 hours. Your child will be released only when the next victim's parents kidnap yet another child. And most importantly, the stranger explains, if you don't kidnap a child or if the next parents don't kidnap a child, your child will be murdered. You are now part of the chain. Woof. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when I first saw the description of this book, I'm like, okay, that sounds really interesting to me. Something I haven't read before. It's definitely unique in that way. Uh, but it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. How about you? Uh, I'm going to say it was what I was expecting only because I ran across a review from a friend of mine on YouTube. So I kind of knew a little bit, but, but she didn't give any spoilers. So I kind of knew that, you know, it was more than just your basic chain letter. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. The synopsis was, I think the synopsis does a good job of explaining what the book is about, where some, you know, are a little vague. It does. It holds true to what's inside of the book. Um, But for me, I was kind of surprised when they got the kid back so fast. I thought it would be more of that, you know, I thought it would be longer for them to get the, the child back. 
Um, so I didn't expect like for them to end up going through that whole thing for the last, I don't know what, 30% of the book, 40% of the book where Rachel and Pete are, you know, having this hard time. And then of course, then they kind of fall into this. Well, Rachel does, well, I got to do something. We got to get out of this chain. Right. But I think like even from the synopsis, it says, you know, to, you had to kidnap a child, another child within 24 hours. And I think that had to do with the rapid, you know, well, not had to do, but the the book, at least the first part of the book was at rapid fire pace. And that might be the part that I did miss or overlooked that 24 hour time frame, because at one point it did feel like it was longer than 24 hours and it may have been it It was longer it was okay because I know at one point Amelia I think that was her name she seemed like she was sleeping like all the time (laughs) it was like this child is asleep still so I feel like it was like three to four days oh it was like over a weekend and it was like she Okay, so I think that Kylie was taken like on a Thursday or a Friday, and then she went back to school on Monday. You're right. I feel like. Okay, I think you are right because over the weekend she was supposed to have attended the Hamilton play with her grandmother because Mm -hmm. her dad came to pick her up. You're right because it was his time for her. So, yeah. The 24-hour time frame is them kidnapping a child. They had to kidnap another child within the 24-hour time frame of the phone call, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Right? Right. That's what it seemed like to me. So, okay, obviously, we've got your kid. And then when they figure out, okay, you're good, we have the money, now you have to get this kid. Right, right, because they have to pay the ransom first, right? right? Then they have to get the child. Right. Okay. The first part was to pay the ransom and then find a kid and have them cleared. Yeah. Like, I guess they do their own research and then have them cleared and say, okay, yeah, that's a good person to snatch. Go, go ahead. Which I found to be not true to their so-called qualifications or requirements I just thought was weird like they cleared them to kidnap a child that had an allergy no remember they cleared him to get the son and then when the son left early he left his class early and and the little sister had his backpack okay so it was the other child the one child was didn't the one child was in a wheelchair or something Okay, so the the next couple right. after them kidnapped a kid in a wheelchair. Right. And I'm just, so, okay, so I guess a wheel, that's still, I don't know. And that is why it's funny to me that Rachel was like, how could you kidnap a handicapped child? <laughs> and then she goes, well, wait, I kidnapped a kid with an allergy. Right. He died. So I... <laughs> I thought the same thing. I was like, okay, so did you not realize? But that was her last resort, though. That's what I was thinking. Like, Rachel's choice um, to steal, well, not to steal, to kidnap the sibling was a last resort. That other couple, I, I believe that was probably their first choice, and the chain organizers approved it. Yeah, probably. And maybe they approved it because... What I mean, for one, what parent wouldn't do anything to save their child? And then uh, to have a child with a disability probably even heightens it. Now that I speak this out loud, that may have been the factor that say, oh, this is a really good choice because these parents, you know, will do anything for their child and their child who who needs who has special needs. See, I don't even think, in my opinion, that Ginger and Ollie thought that far. (laughs) I feel like they wanted to know, one, do you have anybody in your immediate family that's in law enforcement? That's important to them. Right. So they had to check that out. And two, could they pay the ransom? (laughs) How much money you have? 
how much more? Right. What can you pay? Like, they even said at one point, you know, when Ginger was, you know, we didn't know who she was. She even said to Rachel, hey, that's only a portion of what they have in their savings account when they ask for this huge amount from the next couple. Yeah, that's right. The Dunleavies. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, you are. I'm. Now that you say that, because I finished it last week. I kind of started it early because I was trying to debate between this, you know, the chain and the other book that we were <clears throat> reading. And then I got into this one and I got a little far and then I had to stop. So, and I didn't go back and, you know, re-listen to it. So you are refreshing my memory. Yay. Cause <laughs> I just finished like yesterday. I know I saw, I'm like, oh, she's going to be yeah. real fresh with the, the um, specifics on this book. I learned my lesson, man. I struggle when I it's been too long, yeah. so I really try to push it right up to the line yeah. right before the discussion. Uh, but yeah, that you are right. The it was it was more about the money, and I guess they maybe try to use you know the child and their needs, and um, because. When they do the background on what parent to research, you know, so it's so it's more likely the kidnapper is the one researching the parents because Ali. So here's my thought. Okay, now I digress. So after the parents choose the family, the next family, Ali and Ginger. Nine times out of ten didn't really look into, yes, they will do anything and everything to get their child back. They basically looked at their bank account and they just know as what parent wouldn't do any and everything to save their child. Mm -hmm. So now when I think about it, they weren't really saying, okay, let's look at this. You know, is this a good choice? The only good choice was if they had enough zeros and commas. And as long as they didn't have any law enforcement, law enforcement available enforcement, for them. Right. Yeah, they didn't care about the kid. They could give two shits about the kids. They didn't care. Yeah, but they made the, the kidnappers feel like it. Oh, we have to um we have to screen them and approve them. So at first I was thinking, which is why I mentioned, you know, why would they approve a child in a wheelchair and, you know, all these other little things. Mm. But again, it was just about the money. Yeah, I didn't think they were approving the child. I thought they were approving the family. Mm. This is why I love reading books <laughs> with other people. You know, and I'm, yeah. and I'm just being truthful because we we yeah. all begin to see different things in different in different ways, and mm-hmm. and that's what I was thinking. Like, if I was a kidnapper, I would not kidnap a child with any kind Mm -hmm. of ailment because that's going to hold me back. I mean, Mm -hmm. you've watched enough movies, you've read enough books, you have a, a, you know, a child who, who's either diabetic or epileptic. If you don't have their medicine, they could die on it. And that's why Pete, like, I mean, Rachel didn't really want to grab the girl and neither did he. And then when she realized, well, we don't have the time to find someone else. We don't have the time to try to do this again tomorrow or whenever the next, you know, event was for the kid in his little class. Um, They didn't have the time. So they're like, well, we just have to do it. We can't start over. We don't, we can't because the whole time she's feeling the pressure because she wants her child back. And the clock is ticking. Yeah. So so the whole time Pete's like, oh my gosh, you know, he's like, well, how am I going to get my hands on some insulin? I mean, they're like kind of talking this through like right before they nab the little girl. Right. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was a race against the clock. And mm-hmm. I think, and this was probably my, probably the best part of the book that I truly enjoyed that race against the clock and the fast pace, because Rachel and Pete didn't really, they were winging it. They didn't have Mm -hmm. a lot of time to make choices um, or, you know, thoughtful choices. They were just, it was quick. It was on their feet. And I really began to see 
Rachel um, develop as a character in that that little short time span where, you know, because in the beginning of the story, and it, it doesn't mention it in the synopsis, where Rachel at the beginning of the story was heading to a doc no was she either heading to a doctor's appointment or starting her first day at work as a professor um she's yeah a- i think she was doing the well i think she was going to the doctor it, no she's going to work and then they called her and said she needs to come in right was that it right because uh she wasn't working for the longest she was like ubering and doing little you know, a little eyes and in jobs because she had just gone through a divorce, put her husband through law school, business school, whatever. And then she got diagnosed with cancer, was in remission and on her way to, to work or to pick up her daughter, she gets a phone call from her um, oncologist who says, Hey, I need you to come in. Um, and I don't think we ever really heard the diagnosis, but I think she feared If the oncologist is calling me, there's a good chance my cancer has returned. And while on the phone with her doctor, she receives this phone call from the kidnappers that they have Kylie. And that couple was a loose cannon. That mom. The couple that had (laughs) kind of. But you know what, though? Did you notice a trend? So Kylie was very scared of that mother. And then the little girl they kidnapped was very scared of Rachel. Yep. Because you know what? It's the mothers. They are going to do whatever. Whatever they have to do. Mama bears. They went straight yes. mama bear. And they didn't have time for dad or uncle, whoever. They didn't have time. And I, they couldn't coddle the child like they they wanted to. I feel like they felt bad for whatever, you know, yeah. the one couple felt bad for Kylie. And, you know, Rachel felt bad for the little girl they stole but i mean they're more concerned with getting their own child back. right and i felt as a mom i also i i could really resonate with that story not to say my child has ever been kidnapped but i just felt like uh, rachel and the other mom felt i can't get attached because as a mother and nurturing if i become attached to this child or have any kind of emotion i will my mission is <laughs> my mission is to get my daughter back. My mission is to get my son back. And if I show any kind of emotions or I feel sorry for her, it's over, you know? So it, it was like they had to, to detach themselves and just, you know, take away any kind of nurturing, mothering, um, the mothering side of them. And at one point, I think Rachel kind of felt that. And then it, she, you could almost just hear her say, snap out of it. Nope. Nope. It's all about Kylie. Well, she it's did all about when Kylie. she got, um, what was the name of the girl they kidnapped? I can't even remember. Right I don't know now. why I want to call her uh, Amelia. Uh, maybe that's it. it Amelia. Might be Amelia. That sounds okay. right. Um, so when the little girl couldn't sleep, the little girl was so whiny and she went and got her daughter's stuffed animal right. for the little girl. Yeah. So that was, I think, her kindness. But when it comes down to it, and I understand this, I don't have any kids, but I can imagine that if something like this happened to my niece or nephew, I would be right there just Pete. like Pete mm-hmm. helping my sister yep. kidnap some kid. Okay. Yeah. And if it comes down to this kid dying on the floor or me getting my own child back, you cannot go to the hospital. Nope. You cannot go to the hospital. She was going to let her, that child die. Man. Woo. She, I mean, and that was Tamara, like, I that part and no right wonder there. she has nightmares. No wonder she has nightmares. You were going to do that. That part right there. I was, that made me question everything in me would i have done that knowing possibly because that your child was gonna die if you did that your child would be dead and then i mean because i was sitting there thinking okay so my child would be dead but who's to say they haven't already killed you know what i mean even though they say because i don't really know who these chain people are they could be yanking my chain for all i 
freaking know, you know, it, but, it, mm-hmm. and I know this is a book, <laughs> but you know, it just mm-hmm. made me think this like, okay, so I'll have a dead child on my conscience. And then who's to say that my child is going to survive? It, it was, it was just, mm. but in the end, all I was thinking about was my child, but then I'm thinking, who wants a dead child on their, you know? On, oh, I don't think it. I don't. I, I mean, some people don't care because let's let's keep it real. There are child killers in yes. the world, but I think most of us that are normal people would never want to kill a no. child, right? We never want anything to happen to a kid on our no. watch. It would be horrible. Yeah. Um. But this story does make you wonder, like, if you were put in a situation that's lose-lose, right? It's lose-lose. What would you do? How would you handle it? It's easy to say, oh, I would take that kid to the hospital and I'd get help. Okay, dead. your child's dead. Okay, let's let's play within the parameters that we've been given in the chain, right? What then? I mean, what would you really do if you were put in that kind of situation? It's my child. That's my priority. Yeah. That is my most prized possession. That is flesh of my flesh. That is mm-hmm. that is <laughs> that is mine. That is you know, I have respect for all life, but that is my child. Yes, and that is one of the backbones that that how the chain has survived as long as mm-hmm. it has is because they are counting on these parents doing anything right. to get their own child yeah. back. Yeah. And Adrian picked a very, um, a very good story to, uh, to use with the chain, you know, it wasn't just your basic, you know, as they said, how, uh, Ollie, well, not Ollie, but Ginger came up with this idea besides the cartel, um, you know, the chain letters from, Back in the day where someone, did they make her or did they, or did Margaret make someone else, you know, do these things from the chain letter? I can't remember. Remember she said when she was younger and they give someone a chain letter and they'd say, you know, like bark like a dog in the middle of the hallway in school. Mm-hmm. Was it Margaret that was? Ginger was doing She that. was doing it to is other that her, Is that her? Yeah, she okay. was. She was doing that since she was right. young. She's a little psychopath. Okay? Yeah, they were creepy. Well, they were okay. So let's talk about their story for a minute. We got their backstory alongside this at a certain point. It, it wasn't from the beginning, but about I, maybe halfway through, we started getting their yeah, story. Yeah, they were dropping little nuggets. Yeah, so I can't remember what their original names were, but they had these little commune crazy woo woo names when they were kids, the twins. Right. Um, the father. And his father came in, killed the people in the commune, yanked the twins, and left. Basically. (laughs) Basically. So they killed their mother and everybody else, snatched the kids, and left. And now the father and his, you know, wife (laughs) have another child, and they're raising them. For a while. (laughs) And these two are... (laughs) Because they're twins. Yeah, they're yep. twins and they are jealous, diabolical, um, maniacal, <laughs> any kind of name. You know, I'm trying to think of the movie that they remind me of. It, 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 and I don't know if it was twins or was it just Damien or what was the one child that um, Macaulay Culkin played in the movie? Was a step. The good, the good son. son. That's what they reminded me of. But twins. They reminded me of, you know, like when they when they invited, they basically, because the dad, once the dad remarried, he kept making promises to do things with the kids, like take them on a Disney vacation, I believe it was. And they, it never um, happened because dad was too busy. Um and they felt, it seems like they felt like dad was giving the new son and stepmom more attention. And when they finally got a chance to go on this cruise, they tricked their brother into, uh, well, they pushed him over, 
the edge on the cruise. But they had set up yeah, but, that he was like sleepwalking right. all the way up into this cruise. So it, it made it seem like he was sleepwalking and he basically walked over the um the ledge of the the um, line the cruise liners. Well, this just shows you how di- how diabolical Ginger is specifically. I feel like she was the mastermind. the master mm-hmm. planner. Um, she somehow talked her her parents, you know, the father and the stepmother, into going on a specific cruise on a specific ship that didn't have cameras on the outside. Yeah, like she researched yeah. this. They planned for months on how to take that yep. kid out. Yes. And they had to be. And so after that, after that, like the the father really broke down. No, the mom and started abusing the wife. mom. He started. Well, remember, he did hit his wife. Did he hit her? He did. He did. <sighs> Man. Because he started drinking. He was drinking and doing all this other okay. stuff. And then for a while, he, you know, he was stopped drinking. Right. And then the mother eventually killed herself because the little brat Ginger was sending the girl, the woman, <laughs> awful notes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Basically chain letters, weren't they? Yeah. yeah I mean, she's telling her you're an awful yeah. person. <laughs> yeah. You basically kill yourself because you're just, you're, you shouldn't be here on, on earth. You're, you're just that awful. And she she what drank and uh, drank and took pills to the point of she was going into a seizure and they watched her die am i right yeah they were there when she died and at first i thought they killed her at first i thought they did it you know and at that point you know the father is what did i do to deserve this and he's like i know what i did to deserve this i killed y'all mother Mm -hmm. basically Yep. so yeah so at that point he started to, you know, clean himself up. I'm going to stop drinking. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And of course, he slides right yep. back off. Yep. They started going to church and doing, you know, living, yeah. uh, you know, the the good life or according to uh, the Bible, good life. But yeah, so he, he started drinking again and yelling at the kid. What? I think he yelled at Ginger. Oh, the meatloaf. She She ate the last of the meatloaf. And he snapped. Yeah, he like dislocated his shoulder, yep. her shoulder. He grabbed her and snatched her up and dislocated her shoulder. And that was it. It was... They started plotting oh yoga. My God. When he did that, I was like, oh, yeah. You don't know what you just did. Yeah. She was like, oh. You signed your death warrant. <laughs> exactly. She did. Exactly. Yeah. And she was. She was. In the younger years, she was the plotter, but it seems like the older she got, she may have been the plotter, but it, I don't know about you, but to me, it seemed like Ollie became, uh, what does they say? The student becomes the, oh, come on. The student becomes the teacher. Is that the, the yeah. yeah, because I mean, he he seemed a little more wiser. She became more sexual. She she began to to um, make her decisions based on her her uh, sexual wiles or her feminine wiles more. Where Ali seemed to be more um, plot. You know, he he seemed to plot a little more. Yeah. Where, well, I don't even think it was just sexual stuff because I feel like Ali had said at one point where. You take your personal vendettas out using the chain. Mm-hmm. Like she had a woman killed. Okay. Like right. the girl, because she didn't want to be with her or something. I mean, like you personally take anything you feel like you don't, someone did a wrong to you. You trying to take it out on them. You're using the chain to do that. And that's not what it's intended for. But the woman did. So, l- I think because she, she liked the woman, I thought in a sexual manner, right? It wasn't. She did, but the woman didn't right. return it. And that's why I was saying he, he kept saying too that it was she was she was using it to her advantage, but it was also because of her love life because she never really loved anyone. Didn't he mention something like that? Because, you know, she's she liked Marty, that woman, and it was someone else that she 
that kind of personality can't love other no. people. No. No, she was a no, she was a sociopath. Is that a socio or psycho? Yeah, Something. she's some. I mean, she, yeah, yeah. She was just awful. I mean, to be doing the stuff she was doing from childhood, she's not normal no. at all. No, it was, uh, and I believe that might be sociopath, but I can't remember. But yeah, but it seemed like Ali. Even though she did, I just felt like as a child, she she was more the plotting and he followed her. And even the older, like at that last moment when he convinced, <clears throat> excuse me, Rachel to put down the gun or whatever. And, and she was like, are you serious? Are you going to let her go? And he was like, no, but I'm not, you know, he's like, I, you, you basically can get bees with honey than you will with vinegar. And I just felt like he kind of matured in their relationship. You know, he he began to see it um, more of a business adventure where she was using it more to as a revengeful tactic. Granted, they were still making money, but she was using it more um, to get revenge. Did you see that? Yeah, but we also got that earlier as well when she didn't like how Rachel was talking to her. So guess what? <laughs> Give us more money. <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, she Give did. us more money. You stupid bitch. <laughs> yeah, she was very vengeful. She's very hateful. Uh, so she like, oh, you're not scared of me? I got something for you. I do remember that. Oh, in her little uh, voice distorted um voice distortion yeah tactic but yeah um so i was just uh wondering as far as you know the likes and dislikes what did you find as something that you liked from the story well honestly i kind of liked most of the characters um I really didn't have a problem with any of them, even Ginger and Ollie, who were the worst. I still like that they were just villains. And even though they tried to give us, or the author tried to give us this sad backstory, I still felt they were just villains. Like it didn't make me feel empathetic or sympathetic toward them at all. Either one. Um, because they were awful ch- oh, children. <laughs> so, I mean, I like the characters. I did. But with that said, I also like the fast pace of the beginning. It was kind of slower on the back end, I think. I agree. Yeah. What about you? The characters, like you said, there were, it, I liked the way Adrian did every character. Um, Ali and Ginger were villains. He made them out to be the perfect villain. They were villains and you hate, most people hate villains and we hated them. So I felt like he did an awesome job um, with their development as villains. I did not like them, not one bit, didn't feel (laughs) sympathetic. Um, Pete, um, you know, his backstory of his drug addiction and his love for his niece. You know, I think every character that he did... He did a phenomenal job on Marty, you know, being uh, the handsome, sweet talker, everything. I think he did a very good job with um, the characterization or the character development um, and the fast pace. But that last end of the story, uh, I thought something was not right for me when she started to try and figure out who the chain or wanting to bring down the organizers of the change, a.k.a. Ollie and Ginger. Um, it just seemed too cliche, I think, maybe. Um, because I did understand her her desire to do it because her daughter, uh, Kylie, was beginning to suffer. Um, you know, she was wetting the bed mm-hmm. and this, this, and that. But I, I just almost felt like, you doing this, will it make her situation worse or will it make it better? And for you to put that that letter in the paper, 
and they meet up with this guy and, you know, Pete and the guy is even telling them, don't trust me, but she still trusts them. And Pete is like, don't trust them, <laughs> but she still trusts them. And, you know, and they go on this, this, you know, uh, tangent of trying to search for, you know, these organizers. So that end part I don't know. I almost could have done without it, it or a piece of that. I did enjoy the part where Ginger came in as the new girlfriend. Did like that twist. Let me tell you instantly when Ginger started saying I'm in the FBI, yep. I said, it's yep. her. It's and her. Accent, I knew it yes. immediately. I knew it too. I did yes. too. Um, and I did in the other part, I did not like, and I don't know if you noticed it, um, these like little philosophical quotes from, uh, you know, it seemed like philosophers or existentialism people. It would just, you know, and so and so said, and I'm like, is this like an information, uh, infomercial? <laughs> I was like, yeah. and I didn't have the book with me to, you know, like write down who wrote it because, you know, we're listening to the audio and it would just go by. But I just thought those were some of the weirdest things to have in the middle of something I could see if it was written like at the beginning of a chapter you know how some people have like a little quote but it seemed like it was done like right in the middle of the story did you notice that Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. I did not I I thought those those were did it it messed up my the flow of the book Um, but other than that Mm -hmm. uh, I did like it those are the things I did like about it character development the pace um the the storyline, I, I thought it was a great storyline, but then it kind of fell flat at the end. Or there was just something just before the end that could have, maybe that one part with um, the one guy from NASA who that they killed. Was it NASA? No, M, uh, MIT. Yeah, yeah MIT. Him. I think that piece may have may have gotten could have gotten taken out because ginger was our you know she's dating marty okay so let me uh, all right so this is one thing that i did not care for in the book uh i did not care for the rachel and pete relationship because even at one point pete makes a comment of like keeping it in the family Mm -hmm. right he says that to her and they're like, ha ha. And I'm like, Ew, why would you sleep with your ex-husband's brother? Okay? I know. I, under- I understand that when you're in a, a situation that throws you together and it's a in high intense, it's like going mm-hmm. through a trauma together. Right. You, you want to connect, right? But my God, can you just, why couldn't you connect as siblings and right. not like that? Because At the end of the story, Rachel gets her green light for her second round of cancer. But I'm thinking, but she goes and gets a pregnancy test. And I'm like, what the fuck? Okay. And the reason why I'm like, poor Kylie, poor kid. She's going to have a half sibling and a cousin. I was like, she's going to start pissing the bed again. (laughs) Because that's what a child, if they had a child together, it would be a half sibling and a cousin. Yep. I'm like, this girl don't need no more trauma. And I'm like, okay, first off, no, just no. But I knew it was going to happen. I didn't feel, feel like that kind of relationship was necessary to make it work. You could have left that type of relationship out of it and the book would have been just yeah. as strong. But you, I could tell it was going to happen uh, just the way she was becoming so caring about him and his, you know, like that drug addiction and was he on drugs? Was he not on drugs? Um, but yeah, it, it was no longer that, you know, brotherly or like you saying sibling relationship. I could just tell, I can't remember when, but I was like, Oh my God, they're going to get together. And and I felt the same way. Cause I was just like, I didn't like that. Uh, leave it out. Uh-huh. Leave it out. Like, and then the brother, so Marty's cool with it. He's cool. So I guess he's he's kind of a slut anyway. Yeah, Marty is. Yes, yeah, he is. Um, so you left your wife and she when she got cancer. I don't know if it was while she had cancer or before she got cancer, but you left her for a younger woman and you just keep coming with more and more younger yep. women. 
parading him in front of He's a D-bag, so maybe he doesn't care if his ex gets with his brother. Yeah. Yeah. But because like okay, so for example, this that scene where Marty comes and Rachel and Pete are there trying to figure stuff out and you know they I guess she ends up trying to invite them to dinner, uh Marty and his girlfriend at the time that ends up being, you know, just gotten rid of. <laughs> <laughs> and he, she's, he's like hey he's like talking to Rachel all friendly you know he's still calling her like these right he called her babe and and have, like, why don't you go get a spa or right. have a spa day and I'm like yeah and then he goes to his brother hey what are you doing here I know wait I would have been like what are you doing right. here <laughs> and not only that you don't even like, give her enough for child support that her brother has to say when they pull up to this new house, whatever Marty's giving you for child support, ask for more. Yeah. You're not taking care of your family. But yeah, I know no. we, we, we can find those, those little things, but yeah, I didn't like that either. I think them just being a strong front would be enough because I have an mm-hmm. uncle, um, that's on my dad's side that would do anything for me. Um, I won't say anything for me, but I just remember when I was a a little girl that this was my favorite uncle. He showed me how to ride a bike. You know what I mean? So I just, when I saw that, I'm like, I have an uncle that would probably do that for me now. You know, like you said, that kismet or whatever, of that kind of relationship, even if they just kind of kissed and had sex and kept it moving I'd have been more accepting of that because of the situation that they were placed in, you know, it could have been like a release mm-hmm. or something and just kept and then it they moving just moved on and from say, it. this never yeah. happened. What happened in this basement stays in this, you know, or whatever happened in this right. little, you know, cove or whatever stays here. We're done. That's part of the chain. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I would have been okay yeah. with that because like I said, high stress situation, they just got out of it. They were mm-hmm. like feeling grateful and yes. relieved, right, that it a was over. Reliever. So I can yep. see that, but not a dang no. relationship. No. no. New birth. No. Oh, no. Oh. I think I threw up a little bit in my mouth oh. when I saw it. I'm like, what? Did you, she's going to get what? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, they did leave it up to us. You know, she did not say if she was pregnant Whatever. or not. She's just saying either Whatever. way. You it's guys fine. have a relationship. Like, you have a relationship beyond uh, the chain. That's all I got to say. Well, I guess she keep. I guess she just thinks Kylie is resilient for through anything. I mean, she got kidnapped. That She'll be okay if her uncle and her mom get together. That baby's going to wind up like in the little home like the one guy from MIT. Uh, Why you just guys no. got messed up the poor oh, little baby? That. Come on now. Oh, you know, she already she I already know. has it's PTSD crazy. and now you're about to add this. That's you know what? The only thing that was cute for was for you and Pete. You guys were not even thinking about Kylie when you did that. That's why you should have just left it there and kept it moving. Ugh, yeah, no. I didn't like that. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's talk about the audiobook right quick. Uh, but before we do, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we return, we're going to talk about the audiobook narrator. We're going to give our rating. And last but not least, we're going to do our movie fantasy casting for The Chain. Stay with us. I am super excited to share another one of today's sponsors because for you, the listeners of Shelf Addiction, Warby Parker is offering a free five-day home try-on to give you the opportunity to check off their glasses. Try out their glasses from the comfort of your own home. You can take selfies with the various styles or ask all your family and friends what their opinion is without dragging them to the store. To get your home try-on today, go to warbyparkertrial.com forward slash shelf addiction. Again, that's WarbyParkerTrial.com forward slash shelf addiction for your free five day home try on. The link is also in the show notes. Okay, so let's talk about the audiobook. The narrator was January Lavoy. Uh, I feel like we have to spend a little bit of time, a couple minutes on her because we've liked her. I, I think we both like her from yes. other books. I can't remember which book. Oh, was it The Stranger on the Beach? Is that where we first fell in love with her? 
Yes. Yep. Oh, January. I, I'm just going to be brief. I loved her. I, I loved her. Yeah. And if she did the, the voice distortion without a voice distortion, God darn it. I love her even more. She's really she good. Is. I mean, she does uh, the men, the women, the children. I mean, even the little whiny five-year-old. Yes. You know, she pulled I them hate off. you. I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, she's probably, and I think we mentioned this before, that now I'm like looking for books with her. And when when we pick these two, you know, we always pick two books. And when I heard that she was at the narrator, I think I texted you and I'm like, January is doing this, you know, this book. So it was, it, that was like, it sealed the deal besides this being a better book than over the other one. But she's a great narrator. She's very versatile, well-rounded. Um, I, I don't even know what else to say. I loved her. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. Uh, I had no complaints when it came to the audio version no. of this book. I think she definitely elevated the content. That's Yeah, for sure. I mean, she did. You know, like I said, when we were talking about the fast pace, I could feel it. I could feel the fast pace. I could mm-hmm. feel the um, the mother's tension and... Um, you know, like the blood pressure rise. Panic. Yeah, that panic in Rachel and in uh, the mm-hmm. first mother who shot the, the officer. I felt that. I was on the edge of my seat in those moments. Yeah, I definitely recommend the audiobook. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys happen to read this, then definitely, if you like audiobooks, look for other audiobooks by her, with her as the narrator and give some of those a try. Yes. Okay, so I think we should rate it because we still have to cover our fantasy cast and we know that takes us a minute so let's go ahead and rate okay. the thing i'll let you go ahead and go first classy what did you rate the i team? rated a, a four four out of five stars <laughs> <laughs> yes same 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 <laughs> those little quirks that we talked about just took took away from me so yes in a yeah. big way like i mean the end this well at least the last 30 percent for me it was just that whole discovery process of trying to hunt down Ginger and Ali or whoever was in charge of the chain that just kind of fell yeah. a little flat yeah. for me. Um, and there was no surprise. And I guess technically every thriller doesn't have to have a surprise. You know what I mean? But it was easy for me to figure out, obviously, with us switching back and forth, we knew it right. was them. But I don't think that we knew it was them I, okay, refresh me if I'm wrong, guys. I feel like we didn't get the backstory of Ginger and Ali until after we met Ginger. Did that happen after we met her or before we met her? Before. Because I know they were using different names for them. They didn't tell the grandfather part until after we met Ginger. Right. I think you are right as far as the names, but the backstory okay. was so obvious with the twin and... Yeah. There was just, oh, the, her father and the FBI. So, you know, he, he dropped little breadcrumbs yeah. that that let us know who Ginger was without us knowing. Because I, I, too, was trying to mm-hmm. connect Ginger and Margaret. Because I was like, but this one's name is Ginger, but her name was Margaret. And, you know, my brain put it together that they are the same, but, I you know, I just needed something mm-hmm. to seal the deal. But he did throw a little you know, the FBI. And I always, um, I think they mentioned how um, her grades weren't as good, you know, to get into some of those other schools. So, so yeah, you're right. I don't know. I just wanted a a dun, 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 but I didn't get that. And I guess, again, I know not every thriller is going to have that, but it was just so obvious to me. It kind of was like, okay, so Okay. I think his dun 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 was supposed to be Kylie shooting Ollie because of the magic trick she learned, remember, from at the beginning of the, the story and her project. She was supposed to do the King Tut and then Stewart and the magic trick and she got off the chains. I don't know. But yeah, four stars. See, I that wasn't that was kind of blad to me too. Well, we knew they okay, so just to piggyback, we already knew that Kylie knows how to shoot because mm-hmm. of Pete. 
we saw that when she was in the basement and she was going to shoot that guy in the right. kneecap, right? She was going to shoot the, pr- she, we knew, we know she can shoot. So the fact that she went for the gun was not a surprise to me. Um, but she w- did have cuffs on and she did talk a little bit about how she mastered getting the mm-hmm. cuffs off and she never went anywhere without her key that helps get right. cuffs off, which is, you know, again, fine. It played into the story, but I wasn't surprised by not it any of it, none of it. There, he was grasping yeah. for straws, I felt like, at the end. So so four for yeah. me. So that's why yeah. I say four. It was still it was still enjoyable. It just wasn't to the level where it could reach a Yeah, five. not to me. <laughs> and I'll just right. leave that there. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about our cast. I'm gonna pull up the cast photos and uh everybody listening, if you wanna go to uh shelfaddiction.com, you can see the f- people we're talking about if you don't recognize the name. And if you're chatting live with us, now is the time you're going to share with us who you picked. Uh, so we're going to get started with Rachel, our main character. And Classy, you do the honors. You go first. I picked Rachel was Olivia Wilde. And I can't remember. I had everybody else's name down as far as... Um, movies that they starred in that they're well known for olivia wilde is known for uh, um let's see here gosh i thought she was in more movies than this so there on her page it looks like she's known for house she was in house which that's i never house. watched yeah and i'm like Oops, that's it. Let's see what else. Life itself, which I don't know what that is. Let's see what else. Doll and M. Portlandia. Okay, so I'll just tell you why I, I picked Olivia either. Wilde. Gee. In the book, she mentions that her husband says she looked like Jennifer Conley. So I was trying to figure out some Jennifer Conley kind of looks. And Courtney Cox, I felt like, was too old and too much cosmetic surgery. Didn't pick her. And then Demi Moore, I thought, kind of had, a you know, those two look alike. And I thought she was too old. So I thought Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Wilde does not no, look like Jennifer No, but she has Connelly. the high cheekbones and the eyes. But you know who does look no. like Jennifer Conley if you squint? No! Mandy Ward does not. But I she felt does. like Olivia, if she had darker hair, <laughs> because she does have like the cheekbones mm. and the, the jawline. Oh. I guess. Okay, somebody pull up a photo of Jennifer Conley and, and tweet it to us because uh, we need yeah. to see it. <laughs> face to face. Not, not, side by side. I'm like, I, there's no um, way I can say so Jennifer for- Conley. I should have just picked Jennifer Conley because that's who she said she looked like. It was a dead giveaway. I was like, no, I won't do that. Yeah, that's too obvious. But I did pick Mandy Moore um, because I think, I don't know, I can see her, you know, being someone that's, you know, sick and being someone that could take care of her business. Are you just trying to go there with This Is Us? Is that what you're trying to do? Okay. All right. Yes. Well, you know, she's played the role where she's like been all over the place, right? Um. I think she can just pull off the angstiness of it okay. all. So I'll give you that one. Yeah, I'll Mandy Moore. You, I'll give you Mandy. <laughs> all right. Okay. So let's talk about oh nasty brother in law Pete. <sighs> Pete. Drug addict ex military Pete. Um who'd you pick? I picked Jeffrey Dean Morgan. And the picture you chose of him, mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> Look, I like, None like Jeffrey it. Dean Morgan. Whew, that's salt and pepper in this picture. <laughs> Everyone, please go them. to shelfaddiction.com <laughs> and look at Mr. Morgan. And you okay. tell me. I can see it. And you tell me. And Jeffrey Dean Morgan is known, well, for many things. My Grey's Anatomy fans will remember him as Denny who Izzy Dr. Stevens, Izzy Stevens, um, I think she married him while he was on his deathbed. 
He's yeah, also in The Walking. Did she? Okay. And he, he's also um, Negan or Negan in Negan. Dead. Girl, we know you don't watch The Walking Dead. She didn't even say the name right. I I, you know what? I watched probably like the first three seasons of The Walking Dead. That's about it. Oh, I know. okay. So, yeah. So, I do know that. But that you picked a real good picture of Jeffrey. Mm. I tried. I had to. I had to look because sometimes he be looking raggedy. I'm like, okay, let me find a good picture of him. And I was willing for raggedy because he was, a, you know, in in this book, he he had a little raggedness to him. So okay. How okay, so pick? that's why I picked. I, that's why I picked Aaron Paul because I feel like he looked raggedy too sometimes. Oh yeah, Breaking Bad, Aaron. Yes, he's from Breaking Bad. He was in The Path on Hulu. He just like, I can see him being ex-military drug addict. Mm -hmm. I can. I just, you know, with his flannels and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So. It's close. Yeah, I can see that as well. Shooting in the woods. Yeah, why not? (laughs) Yep, I can see that. Yeah, I think our picks with that are pretty neck and neck. There's no clear winner, I don't think. No. Okay, who's next? All right, let's move on to Marty, who is um, the ex and is Pete's younger brother. Better looking, better talking, smooth brother. Ladies, man. Who'd you pick? I picked Matt Bomer. Which? (laughs) Bomber? Bomer? Bomber. Bomber. I think it's Bomber. Yeah. (sighs) Yeah. That's what I think it is. Bomber? Okay. Uh, yeah, I could be wrong, though. I know. Because I don't, you know, like, I've seen him and I know he's good looking, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone um, pronounce his name. But anyway, I know he's from White Collar, because I have watched that. And he was Neil Coffrey um, from uh, White Collar. Also found out that he was in American Horror Story, which I don't watch. Yeah. He was Donovan. Girl, yeah, he was in the season with the um, was it the circus season? Um, it was with Lady Gaga. So whatever season she was in. Oh, oh God, that was hotel season. That was the grossest season. <laughs> yeah, he was in that. He was. He was. Uh, he was also in that other one, Freak Show. I think I could swear he was in the Freak Show season too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've never watched maybe the American I'm Horror Story. So when I looked that up, I'm like. Ooh, so oh, God. okay <laughs> okay <laughs> i think i have a couple of american horror story people in my, my okay already <laughs> okay so i picked um dan stevens you guys know him you know him look at him you know him from downton abbey you watched Downton abbey he was the love interest for one of the daughters. He's so cute. And he's on Legion now on FX. I'm clueless. You don't know you watch Legion. You didn't watch Downton Abbey? No, Girl. No. Clueless. Ugh. I'm like But he's very clean cut. He's very you know, I could see him being an attorney, smooth talking with the younger chicks. Oh yeah. His forties, he's trying to pick up twenty year olds. Oh, I could see okay. it. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Yep. I don't know who he is. He has nice blue eyes. I'll say that. <laughs> That's about it for me. Okay. <laughs> you know I like uh, dark. Okay, let's move. I, I know. I know. Okay. I know. Um, let's go, <laughs> let's go ahead and do Kylie and tell us who you picked. I picked McKenna Grace. And McKenna is... And I remember her from The Haunting of Hill House. She was, um, oh, come on, come on, come on, young Theodora in The Haunting of Hill House. Remember? I didn't even remember her from that show, and I like that Yeah, show. she was the young Theodora. Um, she had dark hair. So this picture, she's blonde, but in that one, she had dark hair. And she was the young Captain Marvel. I remember her from that. Yeah, but she was a young Theodora. So, hmm. yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, I picked someone uber famous right now, and that's Millie Bobby Brown. I can see, because to me, Kylie was kind of a brat as well. Yeah. Um, she was. Even though she had to get herself out of some situations, I feel like at her core, she was kind of a bratty daughter. And I just feel like 
Millie could balance that brattiness with like whole have wholeheartedly having to deal with a a huge trauma that happened. Um, because while the trauma is horrific, it still doesn't take away that you were a bratty kid. Nope. nope. <laughs> um, still at so the core. I just, I don't know. I, I can see it. I can see her just going off on uh, Mandy Moore and all that. Well, you know what? In this I picture, you threw me for a little bit because I'm like, who is that? Because it's, it's <laughs> she's so, um, she looks older in this picture. You know, she's a little more, and I think I'm just so used to her from Stranger um you know stranger things but I- girl she's always made up every photo i found of her well, she's got that new makeup line yeah unless she's on a set she looks made up yeah and she's got her new makeup line so she's probably you know making sure her face is beat so probably yeah so yeah you had a good pick i like my okay. pick too I think I did like your pick. Yeah. Okay. So next up is Ginger, which is half of the evil twins. Who'd you pick? Oh, 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 oh. I picked <laughs> Alexandra Breckenridge, another American horror story uh, actress. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'll have to help me with her name, Mora O'Hara. She was the young Mora. Is that how you pronounce her name? Myra? Yeah, she was Myra? in the very first season, um, the haunting, the season where it was like uh, the haunted house or whatever. I forgot the official name of it, but she was the young maid. Okay. So the ghost of the maid. And she was Jesse Anderson in The Walking Dead. Don't I don't, I don't really remember. Is. Oh, I do. Yes, I do. She dated Rick for two seconds well, she tried to date Rick for <laughs> two seconds, seconds before, because like she liked him and she had an abusive husband and then the he, abusive husband ended up dying and she had this bratty little kid. Oh, let's not talk about The Walking Dead. I'll go there. But yeah, she was on a season of The Walking Dead okay. as a secondary character. <laughs> so that's my <laughs> second pick okay. from The Walking Dead. All right. So I picked... Rose Leslie, and you guys would know her from something very popular called Game of Thrones. <sighs> you she was don't know anything, Jon Snow. You know nothing. <laughs> you know nothing, Jon Snow. And she is also uh, one of the main cast on The Good Fight, which is a spinoff of The Good Wife on CBS. So Ooh. it's very good. Yeah, I heard that was good. Okay. Very good. Yeah, good pick. I like yeah. Rose. I like Rose. All right. Awesome. So last but not least is the other half of the awful twins, Ollie. Who did you pick for Ollie? I picked Tom Payne with those um, expressive eyes. I just felt like when I saw his eyes, because he's from, um, he stars as Malcolm Bright on The Prodigal Son. Um, his eyes are so expressive and I could just see him and Alexandra, aka Ginger, tricking their brother on the cruise. So he was like my first pick. And guess what? Well, we know him. Th- those of us that watch The Walking Dead know him as Jesus. From Thank you. Dead. I was gonna say, and another. So yeah. I have one, two, three Walking Dead picks, and one, two. Two American Horror Story picks. Okay, who did you pick? I know, isn't that weird? Yeah, so I did pick another Game of Thrones person, (laughs) but it was by accident. I picked um, Richard Madden um, as Ollie, and he was Rob on the Game of Thrones. I think that was his name. So he was the oldest brother from the Starks that got killed in the Red Wedding. I would have picked him as Marty. But anywho... He's good looking. Really? Yeah, he is good looking. Cause I mean, but I can see him like, as a twin. But he could be like a little geek. Throw some glasses on him. Yeah, get some grease in his hair. He's just, you know, yeah, be a little geek. I can see it. Um, I can see that. But I do think that Tom Payne can look more creepy, especially after seeing him on uh, Prodigal Son. He definitely has the creep factor, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um. 
So I kind of like your pick better just because I know for a fact that Tom Payne can come off as very creepy. And I don't know if Richard Madden can pull off creepy, but I think he could, but I haven't seen it firsthand. Right. Because of, I mean, what? Because he was in the bodyguard, which is, you know, yeah, not as creepy, but nice picks, no. ma'am. Nice picks. Yeah. Yeah, I think you had some good picks, too. Yeah, so let us know who you picked. If you thought that we were way off base, you could let us know that, too. Comment and let us know what you think of the picks and uh, who did it better. Or did you like some of both of our picks? We want to know that as well. Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. We are done. Are we done, Classy? We are done. Check, check, check. (laughs) Check those boxes. We are done. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Well, it has been real, you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. And of course, uh, if you're listening in the Facebook group, it's been a blast talking to you tonight. And uh, hope you guys join us next month for our next Buddy Read pick. We don't know what it is yet, but we will be able to announce it um, online really shortly. So get excited. We're going to pick something fun for December. I'm so excited. Yes, me too. We've had some good picks these last couple of months. So, all right, Tamara, it's always a pleasure. Same here. And uh, we will see you guys next month. And until then, happy reading. Take care, everybody. Bye. If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcast and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading.